Hi, everyone. Oh, how lovely. Do you realize that was the fastest everybody stopped talking? Hmm. Is that because you all have had so much to say in the break that you just wanted to get back and you're seeing this panel waiting for you? I'm sure that's it. Welcome back to uh, yet another Think It Out panel. Joining us at the table, two people, one of whom has been here before and done a lot of work, Caroline Lane, and Nancy Hill. Uh, we're sorry to announce that another one of our scheduled guests, that was Dr. Jim Likens, will not be able to join us today. So filling in for Dr. Likens to represent the credit union point of view is the familiar face of Caroline, who was, as luck would have it, used to be vice president of marketing at a credit union. So obviously a good choice. Caroline is going to help us with our perspective of things today. The other person who is joining us is the president and CEO of the American Association of Advertising Agencies. Nancy Hill previously served as chief executive officer at Low New York, a veteran of 4A's member agencies on both the East Coast and the West Coast. Nancy has served as executive vice president and managing director at BBDO New York, where she oversaw several of the agency's largest accounts. Nancy joined BBDO from Hill uh, Holiday, where she was the first president of the agency's San Francisco office. She was named one of the 75 most influential women in business, both in 2001 and 2002, by the San Francisco Business Times. Nancy has served on the board of directors of the Miami Ad School and led to the launch of its New York campus. And in addition to the many teaching engagements throughout the country, she is involved internationally in the community as education programs in Ecuador. So a round of applause to Nancy and Caroline. Well, as we have said with regard to these sessions, it is a round table. We're talking. But our, our audience, the members, the customers, as Jeff has called them, are listening in. What do they need to know? You know, I always take a lot of notes. I always try to make sure that what I'm saying is what the audience would want to know. I think the first thing is, everyone is saying this is great information, but what do I do now? How do I go back and communicate this? Jeff, how do they start? What do they go back? How do they communicate it? Do they take one or two things and try and talk it up, or what? What's the suggestion? And I will ask each of you for your opinion on that. You know, my thought would be that you look for the nuggets, the, the two or three things that could change your business, that could change how you interface with your customers, that could drive new business, that could get new members. Um, you know, there was so much here over three or four days. Mm -hmm. My guess is three, four things that would really change your business, that would really change your business. Okay. So that's what I'd look for. Mm -hmm. Caroline. I, I loved what Nancy Loveland had to say about don't hide your light under a bushel. I mean, I think that is such a great message for credit unions. We have such a fantastic story to tell, and I think we are too modest mm -hmm. sometimes. I mean, a little braggadocio might not be such a bad thing. Now, that's interesting because I so agree with the fact that I think the credit union is hiding its light under a bushel in many things mm -hmm. and in many ways. But, Brett, as we get to that, don't you need to know what the message is going to be when you let that light shine bright? I think that was part of what you were saying. You can't just say, here's the spotlight, uh, now what? I, I think the difference is now that it's not just about shining the message but delivering on the message. So how do you measure the success of the way you engage customers? Well, previously, we'd look at things like uh, you know, brand recall and how the message had impact uh, from an advertising perspective. Now, um, people have got the ability to respond in real time and, and you know, vote with their thumbs and, uh -huh. and vote with the mouse. So um, we, we have to start look, thinking about the way we engage customers in a different way in terms of measurement and allowing experimentation. I think one of the, the tendencies is to say, well, we have not done that before, and this is the way we do it. Mm -hmm. So when, when you measure things, you find some opportunities, those three or four things where there's, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a gap or there's an opportunity. And then experiment in that space. Try some different things out. You know, I think what's interesting for me is I actually am a member of a credit union. Um, along, uh, 
<laughs> Here's the reason that they're clapping. Okay. I asked Tony Hawk if he was a member of a credit union. He wasn't. He didn't quite expect the question to be asked publicly. <laughs> I have asked each of our, our guests because I think it's important for this audience to understand that if you have people who have means and have interests and all that, why have they chosen a bank? over a credit union, so that you are a member is why you've got the round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, l l let me explain. I uh, grew up in a very small town in western Pennsylvania, and there is a credit union there called Waycops. There's also a local bank there called Northwest Savings Bank. And then, of course, I live in New York, so I have a bank in New York called Chase. And I bring this up because my way of communicating with each of those organizations and the way they communicate with me is completely different. And when I think about the way Waycops communicates with me, they're really not even on my radar screen. It's kind of a weird relationship as opposed to the way Chase Bank uh, communicates with me or even the local bank in that town, Northwest Savings Bank. And I thought about that a lot after I was asked to come be here today because communication and the way you engage with your customers, especially today, really needs to be a two-way dialogue and Waycops continues to make it one way pushing their message, never asking me what it is that I want from them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. The banks have gotten much better at that. I have my Chase app. I have my Northwest Savings app. I don't have an app with Waycops. And in fact, when I want to do something with Waycops, because I'm in New York, I have to call them up between certain hours, make sure I get a human, because they don't have anybody answering the phone, and then talk to them about what it is I need to do. And that's a very different relationship. Uh -huh. And I have it more out of necessity than anything else. This speaks directly to what you were saying. I think the, the power of the consumer in this relationship now is different. We have different expectations. And so no, we're not just going to sit there passively and just eat up everything you tell us mm. anymore. We, we're like, we're going to test it. We're going to ask our friends. We're going to do our research on this. We're more informed. If you take, say, the, uh, the wealth management space, uh, you know, m members who invest or customers who invest these days. We, banks are finding that these people are coming in to have a discussion about mutual funds or the stock market, and they're better informed than the banker who's sitting mm -hmm. there selling them the product because they've been sitting at home, you know, for the last three weeks doing research on this, and they come in to ask all these questions, and the banker's a generalist because he has to be. So um, it, this is the challenge we face right now is we're dealing with a smarter, more informed uh, in a customer set, and you can't just assume that they'll just believe what you say anymore. They're going to test that. Mm. It's all about the experience. Mm -hmm. You just explained what the experience is like. Caroline, I mean, we have heard Brett talk about it, Jeff has talked about it, you've heard now from a credit union member, you know, of this problem. How does the member experience become enhanced and better among credit unions? It's a great question. Um, you know, having worked at a credit union, I know that many, many times when we, we would get survey results back, because we did talk to our members, you know, we would, did gather mm. quite a lot of data, and um, their number one complaint would be about access and convenience, not quite exactly what you're talking about, but the fact that it was, it was just tougher, there weren't as many branches, there weren't as many ATMs, and so um, I, I do think technology is one thing that can help solve that. I think social media is another way that we can create more of that two-way dialogue and create more of that immediacy of connection. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard a lot about that. I, I'm thinking about that differently than I did two days ago because I think some of our outside speakers have, have um, stimulated some of that conversation here. I think there's another way to look at that as well is that credit unions are built off fundamentally off community, right. mm -hmm. a, a special group of customers. Right. Right. And social media is about community. Right. So theoretically, Credit unions should be better at participating in social media than the big banks because right. they already get community and they exist in a community. They know how to foster that sense of community. Right. So it's just taking a physical geographical community or an industry community and putting it on a digital platform. It, it right. should be easy. But, but for don't you think one of the barriers is I don't know what to say? I mean, I don't know how many times people over the last two days have said, well, if you did a category camp, like I do things, what would you do? I, said, I don't know yet. I mean, right. you need to do research, right. you need to talk. But the question is, what would you say? And unless you have the answer, you tend not to talk to people. Mm -hmm. well, it's very interesting you should say that because I spent the entire morning while I was listening to you guys dealing with something that was happening on our website 
that was talking about something that we just announced and there was all this Twitter craziness and we needed to respond and I had to do it from here this mm -hmm. morning. Mm -hmm. Because it's just one of those things, you cannot leave the dialogue unanswered because everybody expects an immediate answer and Gen Y, it gets even worse. If they put something up on their Facebook page, they expect somebody to be paying attention and responding to it in, within the next five minutes. And mm -hmm. if not, they didn't say it right. Well, and it's funny, to your point, Jeff, um, what would you say? I was talking to our ad agency just before I, I came up here, and I, I, I was reminding him that, gosh, we have talked about category advertising so many times at co-op, and what could we do to help the category? And uh, we were laughing because we had come up with a campaign that actually had some research behind it, and the message from that campaign was, I promised I would be uh, provocative this week, right? The message from the campaign, the tagline was, the simple truth is, to promote credit unions, the simple truth is, banks hate you. That's why they treat you so badly. And we really went, went some distance with that and, and explored some creative like around that. And because I really- like You said you like it. If Jeff, you, do you yeah. like it? Jeff's Let's think sure. about that a little okay, bit. Okay, keep going, but I think it's important because what the you're only, talking about- The only about, risk is it could drag the whole category yes. down. Right. right? Yeah. But, but it's a risk. Right. right, and so that's what we're trying to get everyone here to understand that change does involve risk. It's just how much risk are you willing to take? Is it creatively have boundaries that will give you some kind of return on your investment that will be a positive? Uh, but I, I think the message also is if you're going to do something, uh, if, you know, you've got to be serious about the listening component mm -hmm. here because it's the feedback and being able to respond to that. Um, traditionally, you know, if we look at advertising, it's about let's create a message about what we want people to think about us. And it's, it's creating that, that messaging platform so that we can change how people perceive us. But we've now got a com competing voice in respect to that now, which is what others are saying about our brand. Mm -hmm. So it's not just what we're saying about it, it's what others are saying about it. So being a part of that conversation is very important. So just to illustrate how some are responding to this in, a, in, a, in the wrong way, uh, Vikram Pandit, who's the CEO of Citibank, just announced this week that he now has a Facebook fan page and they put the Facebook fan page up. And then in the next breath, the PR people were questioned about this and they're saying, well, he don't, doesn't actually use the page, right? He doesn't actually update the status. And not good. He's, yeah, and, not good. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, so everything you just did is worth nothing now because you, you had an opportunity there. Um, Either do it or don't do right, it, but yeah. don't pay somebody else to do it. Uh, yeah. And that's what most, unfortunately, most of the big CEOs are doing. They have two or three people who are their social media responders, and it doesn't feel authentic, yeah. not only to the person, but to the brand. Yeah. Right. Because Tony Hawk does his own tweets. We love that. That's great. It is, though, an opportunity. And what you said, Jeff, earlier on about the fact that credit unions should see that they still have an opportunity to own that space or to take that space, to be able to change the, their approach, the way that they do things, this shift. Talk to us a little bit more about how you make this shift because everybody is really nervous about it. They're still saying it's too risky, we've always done things this way, but you are promoting that there is the possibility for change, how they do that. You know, I think I, I would try to make the distinction between communications change and operational change. I, I don't know how you make the operational change. Mm -hmm. What, what I do feel strongly about is that oftentimes, and, and, and you would have a lot of experience with this one through, through your background, oftentimes, um, let's call it a campaign, doesn't have to be paid advertising, but a campaign can coalesce an industry. Mm -hmm. it, it can bring them together around something that, that nothing else can. And th so from a communication change, you can work toward that. You can take baby steps toward getting to uh, a campaign for credit unions. Operationally, you then have to pay off whatever those promises are. Mm -hmm. right. And I think actually for credit unions, it's to be very difficult, frankly, and, and I think you'd have to be very careful about promises because you're all independent, you're all yeah. over the United States. And we had this conversation, I guess it was a dinner, and, and, and I said, one of the, sometimes when you don't have a hard promise to make, in a way, Got Milk, we didn't have a hard promise to make, right? right? Mm -hmm. it, it, we didn't really have anything to say. Um, you end up, I, I think you end up in a better place by saying, 
you have an option, right? So if there's this huge cynicism and this huge in, 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 uh, amount of actual anger about being victimized, which by the way, I would guess a lot of people feel victimized by the financial services industry. Right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's enough to say, you know, you have an option. You have a choice. There's another way to do it. Now there's no promise in that. Well, and, and you don't have to do that using negative. You can use exactly. that, uh, do that positive. Because mm -hmm. yeah, I think one of the things about credit unions, when I think about credit unions, they, are, they do have that community positivity. Mm -hmm. And I would hate to see, if anybody went down that road, you taking a negative because I think it could hurt the thing that you have the highest regard. It, yeah. It's a tough place there's, to go. There's a danger, though, that we too often, I think, stick to wearing the white hat. And we so rarely take the gloves off. Mm. And really, the banks have done some things to, frankly, mistreat the consuming public. And um, I think they do hate some of their, their customers. <laughs> yeah, they, they probably do. But I think I think I, I could be wrong about this. But I, I feel pretty confident that all of your member customers also have a bank account. Oh yeah. Right. So uh -huh, there are multiple, yeah. multiple. You use multiple like uh, financial services. Yeah. Right. So one needs to tread a little carefully on that one because sure. they already have a Schwab account and a Citicorp account mm -hmm. and a. I don't know if you guys saw the Move Your Money campaign that was uh, big. Yeah. You know, so this is a, I think this is an example of what you're talking about. Um, and it was reasonably successful. About mm -hmm. 4 million uh, right. people went and opened bank accounts with uh, community banks and credit unions for that very reason, that it was sort of paying it back to the big banks who caused the global financial crisis. But then um, you, after that, you've then got, OK, so now what's different? And right. that there's where you need sort of a service strategy, really, because that's what's got to make you different from a long-term perspective rather than just the message. It's absolutely true, because there are case after case after case where there was great advertising, wonderful positioning, but the product wasn't fixed. Right. right. And it killed it. Yeah. And they won't come back. You're going to get one chance. If you're going to put a message out there, you're going to get one chance to prove it. And you won't be able to do it again. So it has to be managed very carefully. Jeff and I were talking a little while ago about these baby steps. And I don't know where you got to when you did that campaign or how long ago that was. We or, actually never did it. Or, it was or a thought even on the, a whiteboard. Or yeah. even the research that went into it in mm -hmm. terms of the timing. Mm -hmm. But what, what we talked about, because I actually have worked with a couple of national associations who tried to get to that place because they did want to emulate Got Milk. And it just felt like it was too big of a, a hurdle to get mm -hmm. over. Mm -hmm. But if you do some research that doesn't have to cost a lot of money, and you find out if there's an opportunity, there may not be, mm -hmm. and if there is an opportunity, what it is that you can exploit, and then come back and say, okay, we have an opportunity to do this, and that research might only cost you $50,000. It's not a $20 million advertising well, campaign. Well, with online research, it might cost it, you a lot it less. It could actually. be less, yeah. Yeah. exactly right. Well, in fact, we have had speaker after speaker say, and Nancy Ludlin, who was here and was talking about, you can do less with more. Yes. She started out, in her first business with a $5,000 inheritance from her great-grandfather. It's dressed for success, which is hugely successful. So the doing more with less theory is very important. But the question I'd like to ask you all, and I'll start with, with you, Jeff, is in order to make this behavioral shift, how do people commit to that? You know, how do they do that? Much like the story I said of my husband and I now only have uh, our smartphone, we don't have a hard line. We made it, as you were saying, because we trust our children. They're in the element, they're in the midst of this, and we're doing it, and it's okay. But a behavioral shift is very difficult. How do people begin to commit to it? In terms of the customers? In terms of the customers, customers? yes. You know, I think it, it, it starts with a very good idea, and, and as I tried to express, and I, I don't know if it was successful, but, you know, <clears throat> the person has to run into the customer has to run into that idea 20, 30, 40, 50 times in different places at different times from different people before that idea starts to get below the surface and get down to where they're thinking, yeah, you know, I've heard that about credit unions. I don't know where I heard it. And, and then the person they're sitting with said, you know, I heard the same thing. Mm -hmm. Where did you, I don't know. I think I saw an article about, and so, so it's, it's, it's repetitive, it, it, not in a boring repetitive, but it, in, you, to break through the, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of messages 
we get a day. Mm. It really takes a tremendous amount of frequency, mm -hmm. but not in the traditional advertising reach frequency, but in the conversational frequency to get below the surface to get into that consideration set. It the, really requires a lot. The number of mes messages these days is exponential. I mean, when you just think about looking at your own Facebook page and the message after message after message after message, and sometimes it's people saying, you gotta love the way J. Crew handled something, or you gotta hate the way Gap changed their logo. That happened so fast. Yeah. When Gap changed their logo, they, they had it out a day. A day with a new logo, and within a day, they were apologizing for changing their logo. But that's because they are engaged, they have the feedback, they understand what the customer is But the mistake they made was they not engaging. Exactly. Yeah. Not engaging. All they had to do was ask. Exactly. Yeah. They'll get response. I mean, Starbucks just took coffee off of their logo. Right. They took yes. their name, Starbucks Coffee, off their logo and left whoever she is. It's the mermaid. Mm -hmm. The mermaid <laughs> up right. there. I, we'll see. Yeah, it's very we'll interesting because I don't think, it, it, to me, it's unprecedented that consumers are believing that they have a right to say something about your advertising, your marketing, your message. They really believe that it's their position to tell you how to handle your business. This has never happened before. Absolutely. It's always, we put a message out there and hope that people respond to it. Now they're telling us how we're supposed to behave, mm -hmm. and we have to listen to them. The value of research is so important. Again, the reporter in me, I have to research things so that I can say with a, a sense of responsibility and awareness that what I'm about to tell you is accurate. With that thought in mind, Brett, what is the biggest risk that you see for credit unions if they do not make this behavioral shift and understand the customer's power, the immediacy factor, all of those things? So you've got this dialogue going on at the moment between your brand and customers in a very open platform. Um, and we've seen the Gap example, there's United Breaks Guitars, mm -hmm. there's all of these examples we see of these critical moments. But I like to illustrate it this way, because the first question I ask the, uh, the credit unions is, who's your head of social media? And they, they am and are, and well, you know, we have someone as this Twitter account, who's our head of social media? You know, it's like, <laughs> um, so then I say, well, think of it like this. Um, you know, you've got this, you've got a customer, an irate customer walks out of a branch after having a bad experience. And what he did in the past was he'd ring up his wife or you know, uh, she'd ring up her husband and they'd rant and rave and then later on they'd think about it and they'd get more upset and they'd get on the, the phone to the call centre and they'd say, I've got a problem, I want to make a complaint. So the same thing happens today but that person gets onto you know, his social media platform, conferences in 30,000 of his closest friends and family and has the same rant and rave and then halfway through the conversation we hang up on him because there's no one to answer his, his issues. And then suddenly, those 30,000 people who are watching that go, oh, these guys are hopeless, and they retweet it, and suddenly you've got three million people talking about it. So unless you're part of the conversation, and unless you can proactively show that you're involved and that you care about what customers think, then that's the biggest risk, because you'll have, something will guarantee happen to you in the next uh, couple of years that will be that reputational risk moment where suddenly everything you've worked for for the last four or five years, you're now in, in firefighting mode trying to undo this damage that one unhappy customer has done on social yeah, media. Because my guess is that you probably won't know that you might have a customer who has 30,000 followers. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, a mommy blogger out there who's become very popular right. and the last thing you want is for that mommy blogger to describe a bad experience that she had in a branch for the people who are following yeah. her. And you just don't know. A lot of those people live in our little communities and are just doing things from home. It's not like they have to be nationally famous anymore. But, and conversely, you take that same mum who's got a, who's a blogger and 30,000 followers and she comes in and asks for a credit card and you say, she's got a marginal credit rating, sorry, no, you don't qualify. And it's like, hang on a second. If she told those 30,000 friends about how excellent we are and just, a hundred of them signed up. We should pay her to do that. <laughs> exactly right. As you look, Carolyn, I would like to ask you this question. We've talked about category marketing. We've seen the success of Got Milk. Mm -hmm. I love the story of it because I think some people, you know, some people will just say, "Wow, that was great. You got lucky." No, you got an idea, a strategy, a discipline. So it is this category marketing that has worked so successfully there. 
can category marketing work successfully for credit unions? Talk about provocative. Um, yes, I, I, the short answer is yes, I think it could. Um, have we gotten it off the ground successfully? No. And uh, there have been some, some valiant efforts. I know here in California, our local trade association um, did some category marketing and with, some, with some results, with some measurable results. Um, our, the challenge that we face, and I hate to focus on the challenge, the challenges that we face have to do with the fragmentation um, to your point, there are a lot right. of endpoints out there. You know, there are 8,000 credit unions, and um, and they don't quite want to let go of their individual brands yet. And and yet, while we are a very collaborative movement, um, we sometimes become a little bit proprietary about our own brands. And that's that's surprising to me because I remember when I first entered the credit union movement, I came from a thrift. So yes, I am a recovering banker. <laughs> and. And I, I remember the first day on the job, I thought, you know, I should go benchmark off of some other credit union VPs and see, see how they do it. And I, I took a risk, and I know there's somebody here from Schools First today. I, I took a risk, and I called Orange County Teachers Federal Credit Union was their name at the time. And I said, hey, you know, could I just sit down with you? And um, not only did that person agree to sit down with me, but she agreed to share her marketing plan with me. She was in the same market. I mean, coming from a thrift, I was blown away that there was that willingness to be so collaborative. And yet, it happens at a micro level. Uh -huh. It doesn't happen as well at a macro level, because we do still want to kind of hang on to our own identities. But you know, it's interesting. Milk has many, many brands. Right. It's, right. it's very rarely just sold as milk, sure. the way it's portrayed in the commercials. Right. I mean, that's done for purposes of not usurping somebody's brand. Sure. But you go into any grocery store, there's 11, 12, 13 different kind, right. different variations of milk. So I think milk is actually a really good example because Horizon Dairy didn't have to give up their brand. The mm -hmm. local dairy didn't have to give up their brand. Mm -hmm. that all, when you do category marketing, you can lift all boats with that yes, advertising. Absolutely. Raise I, the entire category. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, yes. I, agree. I, mean, I do agree, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you think about it the other way, it, it, if the category is a pie and you're fighting for share, right? If the pie shrinks, then your share goes, your, your business goes down. And the only way to get more is, in, in, is to lower your rates or lower your price or in case, your case is raise your rates in order to get more. If the pie is growing, it's when brands do the best. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's when brands do the best is when the pie is growing. So they work together. The category program grows the pie at the same time that the, that the brands, in this case the credit unions, individual, then it's their job to grow their share. Right. right. That's their job is yeah. share. And the, leverage the national campaign at absolutely. a local level because it makes it much easier at a local level to do your marketing when you've got a national umbrella campaign. Absolutely. Preachers meet the choir. I, mean, I, I could, not, could not agree more. And I, I do think that there needs to be some recognition that credit unions are a category. We should be a brand unto ourselves. We are different. I mean, we, we don't have paid shared holders. We don't see, um, after a board meeting, the board members trotting on down to the branch and cashing their check, which I used to see at Downey Savings, who's gone now. <laughs> Um, we don't see that, but we do see our categories shrinking. The pie yep. is getting smaller, and we do see single-digit market share, and that hasn't moved. Mm. And it has. We haven't even seized on the fact that banks are, are tripping all over themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, and that, gosh, as a marketer, that's just a big juicy apple I want to take a bite out of, and it's it's a problem we haven't solved yet. With that in mind, Nancy, um, what are the commonalities? of best marketers, because I think what you just said is to seize the opportunity, you have to know what do you use? What, what are some things, you know, among wealthy people, for example, they say, you know, wealthy people love their job. Wealthy people understand that they find a dollar and it's not what can I do with this dollar, but what can this dollar do for me sort of thing. So what are some of the, the commonalities for best marketers so that our credit union attendees are able to say, Let, we can do those. We can embrace those. Well, I, I think when you look at some of the best marketing slash advertising that's out there, number one, it's, it's always focused, and it is relentlessly focused. Strategy by its definition means that you're going to leave some things off the table because it's going to tell you not only what to do but what not to do because if it's not on strategy, it doesn't get done. The interesting thing about advertising is that 
people will consume whatever it is you're asking them to consume off strategy. So you can't tell them, as Jeff said, you can't tell them what to do. You can tell them how you would like them to think and where you'd like them to feel about your brand. Look at Apple. Um, but, you, but you really don't want to demand of them that they go into the credit union tomorrow and open an account. Okay. They need to have a reason to believe that that brand fits for them. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, Jeff and I were talking about this offline before, about this shift, you know, what social media and digital has do done from this sort of messaging platform to now an engagement platform. And I think what's clear out of this is that there's going to be marketing departments which are really challenged by this shift. And, you know, because you've got these marketers who, you know, for the last, I don't know, however many years, decades, have been in this process where January will advertise credit cards yep. and February will advertise personal loans and March will do this, this campaign approach. Whereas now, you know, the campaigns do help stimulate, but now it's more about that engagement strategy at any point of time where it makes sense. And so partnerships are going to be really critical in yeah, the future. You that. can't keep it all in-house. In you've got to have strong agencies. You've got to have strong partners. You've got to, um, and, and th there's too many technologies now. There's too many ways of getting that message or engagement happening. But you can't have, yeah, credit union can't possibly have all the skill sets required. And I'll just make a plug for our members. We have almost 1,000 members. I, I would guarantee you that in every single one of the towns that you're in, you could find one of our member agencies who'd be willing to work with you. It doesn't have to be a Jeff Goodby. It can be somebody in the local market who understands your brand. Mm -hmm. Well, and you put in a plug, so I'm gonna put in a plug. <laughs> um, and of course, co-op could help our member credit unions with that as well. I mean, by extension, we know a lot of credit unions don't have big marketing campaigns. I came from one. Um, we do have some marketing materials that they can use to lift the brand. Um, we have the ability for them to push marketing messages out to their ATMs. Uh, you know, so we have some tools, and obviously, these aren't these aren't wealthy organizations all the time. I mean, it, you know, it's it's tough times in financial services. So, how do you my find plan. the focus, though? I think the focus is so critical. Again, as a reporter, if I were coming here to cover the story, mm -hmm. I would have listened and I would have, as I do with my takeaways, I tell you, you know, what the notes are, but the things that really resonate with me, mm -hmm. focus is so critical. Right. I don't know that everybody is focused on this. I have heard people talk about, should the name change? Should we call ourselves credit unions? I mean, I thought, oh, hmm, you know, I, I really should like we? That. Should it be called credit unions? Expound. Talk a little bit more about why you wonder. Yes, Thanks, I'm putting guys. you on the side. <laughs> No, no. I, you know, I, I think the, the fact that credit union, um, that's what you call yourself already. You can't <clears throat> just say, oh, we're not going to call ourselves that. We're going to be something else. But, but, I do think that, but I do think that one could talk with consumers and mm -hmm. say both people who are your current customers and non-customers and say, you know, if we were to describe a, an organization that did the following things, what would you think of them if they were called this, if they were called that, and if they were called credit unions? What would you think? What comes up for you? And frankly, it could be qualitative stuff. It doesn't even have to be right. big quantitative mm -hmm. research. What do you, and you're in the back, again, you're behind the glass, and they say, well, I don't know, credit, oh, I have you know, I went for, I didn't get the credit I was looking for. So right away, they're starting from, uh, I heard I how hard credit is to get. You say, okay, and, and credit union. And, well, you know, unions, I know that the, you know, there's a big workforce in New York and they're having all those problems with the unions and all that sort of stuff. And you say, okay, but, you know, and so you work your way through that. And I'm not saying the name should change. What I'm saying is be aware that you have that name and it has certain, baggage, it has good things and it has bad things, but if you don't recognize it, then you can't work through it. You can't work around it. I've got an idea. Why don't we call ourselves We're A, Not a Bank. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, but that's the option thing that we were talking about before, is sometimes yeah. just saying you have a choice yeah. Yeah. is yeah. just about all you have to say to get people to think, I didn't realize that. I mean, I have a choice. Yes. I don't have to go to a bank. Right. That's not a bad start, guys. Right. I mean, just, exactly. I mean, that would be okay for me. I think Exceed Federal Credit Union may be the one who said that their tagline was banking without the bank part. I think that was theirs. Mm -hmm. If I'm attributing it to the wrong person, take yeah. me down later. But I, that we have had some unbanks out there, that kind of thing. Yeah. And um, so there has been some of that, you know, point counterpoint type right. of Right. But nomenclature is important. Yeah. I mean, names important. are important. Absolutely. And, um, Much like you said 
not members. And again, not pretty, uh, this I think was very good because what you were saying is ask the customer. You call them customer, credit unions refer to it as members. It's not that you're saying that's bad, it is just they need to engage in conversation. Well, find out what it means. Right. I mean, personally, I don't know they want to be members. I mean, membership to me has a lot of attachments yeah, to absolutely. it. Yeah, absolutely. Right, yeah. I'm gonna get emails, I'm gonna get mail in the thing, I'm gonna have to attend meetings. I'm gonna, I mean, I'm not sure membership is good. I don't know. So using myself as an example, until I knew I was gonna be coming here to do this, I did not know I was a member. I, I, seriously, I didn't. I don't think of myself as a member. You thought of yourself as a customer. As a customer. I, I did not realize that they even referred to me as a yeah. member, so and it's. Yet, yeah, and yet credit unions think that that builds affinity just by use of the nomenclature. I'm not sure that's necessarily true. Well, yeah. You can find it out. Well, it could be if, if you could define what the benefits of membership are, with apologies to Amex, right? <laughs> but um, you know, if, if you could, if people identified the fact that being a member was a special class of customer and that I got benefits from that, then, mm -hmm. but you know, have we articulated those benefits of being a member of a credit union Maybe versus not. being a customer of a bank? I guess yeah. that's the question. Right? Maybe not. I want to make sure that all of you know, as we have done the last couple of days, do you have questions? Is there anybody out there yet with a question? Please get ready because we will definitely have that conversation with you. I'd like to also ask now if we could stream tweet to see what those who are joining us that way are saying. I have one that I'd like to give to the panel that came in yesterday and it says, suggestions for getting past management that does not embrace change. That was the topic that they wanted us to discuss. Bring them here. Quote, in <laughs> fact, answers every suggestion, idea, thought of change with, quote, we have always done it that way, end quote, and refuses to acknowledge the importance of alternative advertising. Uh. I, I, would, I would say two things. One is, it's easier to ask forgiveness than ask permission. So just go and do it and then prove it works. There you go. I like uh, that. It's my philosophy as well. Secondly, I'm guessing that probably this guy is of an older generation. Meaning Three? the manager. And, yeah, the, the, and manager. the guy. Yeah, yeah. or the manager. And the guy. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Two rather big assumptions. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, probably true. <laughs> Bring the grandkids in to show them how they use Facebook or, in the, or their mobile phone. All right. yeah. Here is something else. Let's see. Credit unions, especially the word union has a bad connotation, is a name change in order. So here we are. We're on point. This is one of the things that, as you were suggesting, Jeff, there needs to be a conversation about it. Unbanks. I like it as a start. Um, I didn't know I was a member. I thought I was a customer. Uh, the reason, let's see, you can spend millions on ads, but if my friends say you suck, no dice. Exactly. <laughs> In fact, great advertising will kill that product fast. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, there are lots and lots of opinions about traditional mass media. Is it dying or is it evolving? Uh, it's definitely evolving. It's not dying. Until the experience of watching the Super Bowl <coughs> is as good on your handheld device mm -hmm. as it is on your television, television's not going away anytime soon. Is it changing in terms of the way that we use it and the way kids use it? Absolutely. Kids want to watch television on whatever device, whenever, wherever they are. Consequently, they don't think anything of watching Hulu on their mobile phone. But I think where we are now is that we have actually a wider net in which to put our messages. Uh -huh. and, and we also have to use them differently. Many times what's happening on television is getting tweeted at the same time that it's getting IM'd at the same time that it's getting uh, sent out on somebody's Facebook page. So it's not just one screen at any one time or one device at any one time. And, and I think the trick is to navigate all of the channels that we have and make sure that they're all working together and adding up to a very authentic story and narrative and dialogue that we're having with our consumers. It was interesting at last night's dinner, Jeff and I talking a lot, and the three, I don't know where you are, but we enjoyed you completely at dinner last night because it was the beginning, don't you think, of this conversation. Exactly right. Exactly. And one of the things as we try to figure out how do you get new members, customers, whatever that nomenclature is going to be, and then you introduce us to your daughter in your presentation and you say, she's not gonna do it that traditional way. How 
will credit unions get, her name was Hannah? Yeah. Yeah. How will credit unions get the Hannahs and her friends? And furthermore, do credit unions need to change the opinion that we really want people who have money? And you may love Hannah, but Hannah has no money. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, is she and her, her group the right new customers? I tend to believe their organic growth says you better sure. get her early. Yes. But your comment. Well, if you take a long view, obviously. Um, and I think also if you look at those customers, they, they can be more profitable because of their, their use profile. They're, they're not coming in using the branch all the time. They're not, you know, they, they, they tend to save more. Um, you know, they, so there's a, there's a different mix where you can say a customer that may not have been profitable before may be profitable if their behavior is different. Mm -hmm. There's an opportunity there. But I think if th those kids, the Y gens today, they're much more likely to have affinity with your brand if they've got a message about that brand on the phone or via social networks than they would be through TV. And the way they consume content on TV is they download a program and they watch the program. They don't watch TV commercials. Right? So we've seen this already having an impact on TVCs. But that doesn't mean that you know, TVCs and broadcast advertising is disappearing. But I think what will happen is I think the campaign will disappear I think branding will remain. Branding will still remain as a broadcast mechanism. And I think engagement will replace campaign. That's my personal view, but. Well, I, I will only differ on one front, which is they don't watch bad advertising. Uh, because vi good advertising goes viral. Good right? advertising okay. goes yeah. viral. So, oh, I, you know, if, if your message is right, if you've managed to reach their head, their heart, or their funny bone, one of the three, then they're going to do something with it because that's what they all do. They'll parody it. Right. which you have to let them do it. Yeah. Um, you can't deny them that, but that's how it gets out there. They don't watch bad advertising. Yeah. So are credit unions willing to take a calculated risk? It is, that, as we have heard throughout these couple of days, even though people can understand the importance of it, understand that young people use it, your demonstration today I loved, it was real, it was entertaining, and it was like, yeah, do they do this, or do they swipe, or whatever. How do we get credit unions to understand the importance of getting caught up. They're, you're not out of the race yet. There just needs to be an urgency about catching up to some of the things that, that Jeff and Brett have talked about. Mm -hmm. How do you convince? How do you do that? What's the organic I, look, growth with that? I, I, don't, I think we have to get out of this mentality that if we do X, Y, and Z, and we get to this point, then we'll be OK and uh, we can relax and again. And we're done. Right. This is, you know, we have to be an organization of continual adaptation, yeah. right? And listening to customers is a very important part of that process. And I think that's, we have to get into this, uh, an organization structure that allows us to have that agility and ability to adapt. I also think that the credit union community needs to understand that if they really are trying to go after a wealthier individual, chances are, those are the people who are using a lot of technology, a lot yeah, of different approaches sure. to banking. Mm -hmm. They don't have time to go into branches. They don't have time to sit on the phone trying to get a human to answer their question. They want an immediate answer because that's the world they live in right now, especially if they're still in business. Yes. Because you can't survive any other way. Mm -hmm. It's not like even five years ago where the CEO of a company had a, an assistant who printed out his emails in the morning and he would dictate the answers back and the email would go out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I know worldwide CEOs who I can send an email to at 2 o'clock in the morning and I've got an answer in 20 minutes. Mm. So the, the fallacy that the wealthy are not involved in all of this is just Absolutely dead wrong. Agree. So maybe the question, Caroline, to you should be what should credit unions stop doing in order to have the resources available to pursue this? It's not a race, it's a marathon. I always yeah. say, you know, with, with money, it's the journey, right. and we heard that term journey today, and you don't reach a destination and then go, okay, we're there, it's fine. Right, right. What should you stop doing? Well, I, I think that um, back to that research question, I mean, we, credit unions would be well served to know exactly what's meaningful and relevant to their field of membership because, you know, we have some high tech credit unions who do expect the latest and the greatest, and if you don't have um, it's certainly a fantastic mobile banking application, and that's just table stakes, and probably a lot more than that, you're going to look irrelevant to that field of membership. 
there's some occupationally based credit unions, far fewer than there used to be, who really aren't demanding as much. And so let go of what is not important to your member base. Okay. You now, can I make a suggestion? One thing that might be helpful is if um, co-op could help design that survey right. and then make the survey available to the members to send Straight out to idea. their local community. Yep. Because sometimes designing the survey is a costly sure. effort, sure. but if it were done at the trade association level and mm -hmm. then given to the members and allow right. uh, the, put, the, put it out there in their local community, yeah. it might be a great way to start. And maybe also just collect together that um, sentiment analysis about what people are saying about credit unions the good and the bad, and see what are the influences. Yeah, I think it's a good idea, but what I think would be even more um, per persuasive in the end is if one did a national study and then had a whole series, same questions, yes. a whole series on a local level. So by maybe by region, not by, you mm -hmm. know, maybe you do Northern California, Southern California, Valley. But if you could then say to people, look, this is what people, your customers said nationally, or non-customers said mm -hmm. nationally, but look, California is very different than New York in that mm -hmm. respect, yeah. right? Those are big differences. Now suddenly people are saying, whoa, that's really interesting, because I, I can tell you that the Central Valley of California is going to have a different point of view about that's credit unions right. than San Francisco. Yep. Absolutely yeah. can yep. tell you that, because Absolutely. it's ag-based, it's, it's community-based, so, you know, running that nationally and then yep. on a regional basis could be right. really an interesting project. And I like your suggestion very much. Um, that's something that co-op could easily facilitate to make some, some kind of more grassrootsy kind of um, uh, tools available. We do have, we're not a trade association, but our trade association does do some of that research. The Lean Research Institute, mm -hmm. who was one of our guests mm -hmm. here this week, they do some fantastic stuff. And so maybe in collaboration, we could do things on a, on a sure. broader level yeah. as well. Yeah. We have a question in the audience. Hi, please give us your name and your organization. Hi, Tabitha Garvin with the Montana Credit Union Network. We had a very successful statewide campaign that was very focused. It was on um, small loans under $300. Short term, we all, we were looking at the issue of payday lenders and predatory lending, and we decided to advocate and bring awareness to what credit unions can bring to our entire state. And um, we found outside funding, so it was not funded by a single credit union in our state. They didn't have any dollars in it, but they got the benefit. But we had to work really hard to get their full buy-in mm -hmm. to, because our, our embarrassment would be if somebody came in to look for a loan and was told, we don't do anything like that, get out of our doors. Mm -hmm. And so we had to prep every credit union in our state for how to respond, and we've seen a great increase, and, and like Jeff experienced with the Got Milk, those, we paid for one month of advertising, and those ads are still running seven months later. So it can be done, you just have to work hard. Wow, how you. did you find outside funding? Uh, we went to the national level, ah. National Credit <laughs> Union Foundation. We applied for a grant. Mm -hmm. There you go. Terrific. Okay, that's wonderful. Any comments? All right, let's look at tweets. Please let me know if there's anybody in the audience. Uh, yes, create the survey. You see, <laughs> does this prove the point of immediate, social media? Immediate. I yeah. mean, there's feedback. So it is worthy, at least in the minds of one person, yeah. and we don't know how many followers that individual has, how many friends or whatever. Um, Disneyland for X is a study in storytelling as value. Value without story means you're a commodity like the electric company. Um, instead have, have of- look at the next tweet. I've got it on the phone. Oh, please do. Uh, so, reading live tweet screen more, more than listening to the expert panel, what does that say about <laughs> Ah, <laughs> at, please, it's what does that say? AED, right? <laughs> This is, this is the oh, new world. It is the new world. <laughs> Everybody has ADD. We're, we're vying for your attention against Twitter. I get it. It's no problem. Buy right? stock and Adderall. Yeah. <laughs> we have another question in the audience. Where are you? Over here. Hi. You need to stand up. I can't find Hi. you. Hi there. This is Sandra Scott oh, from okay. Patelco. And all I wanted to do was uh, to share our branding at Patelco. We actually did uh, rebranding on our website and so forth. And we do not call ourselves Patelco Credit Union any longer. We just call ourselves Patelco. So I was looking at my cards, you know, and I'm thinking, I don't think we write credit union at all any longer. 
And it's true. We don't on our cards or our website or any type of um, mailings that we do. But one other thing that we did was we changed our tagline. And honestly, I don't even remember what our tagline was, but I'll never forget this one. It's called Bank on Trust. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're using, and um, this is how people are remembering us. Although we are a credit union that's celebrating its 75th anniversary this year, um, we truly believe that um, this rebranding is going to be able to help us and engage with a uh, new generation and hopefully uh, continue to, to keep our, our um, long-lasting members as well. You know, so now that you took credit union out of the name, aren't people confused yeah. about what you do? No, just kidding. Well, <laughs> you know, there's, there's a national precedent for that, which is GEICO, right. which yeah. stood for a government employee insurance company. But when they decided that they were going to expand their customer base, they just called themselves GEICO. And by the way, Aflac, too. Yeah, yeah. And we it's changed true. our name from the American Association of Advertising Agencies to the four A's because there's big debate over what is advertising. So mm -hmm. there, there is precedent for dropping the descriptor. Hey, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken became KFC. KFC right. Um, right. International House of Pancakes became IHOP. I mean, you know. Look at this. We know it. It's like <laughs> <laughs> we're proving the point, it's a fun right? game. Right. Like <laughs> but there are reasons for those things. Well, in, in the case of Patelco, if I can put you on the spot for a minute, I think I was sitting in a California Credit Union League breakout session maybe 10 years ago. And I forget, I think it was at the time what it would have been the equivalent of your CIO got up and said that some members thought that Patelco initially meant like an Indian restaurant because it had the name Patel in it. So, um, so you all, we, a lot of us have those types of challenges inherent. Uh, I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, in our San Francisco office prior to moving to our new corporate headquarters, we would have tourists taking pictures because the name <laughs> Patel, Patel <laughs> was in our, in Patelco. So it, it was quite... Um, amusing to see that, right. you know, uh, almost every day having but, somebody taking that picture. But the, what do they say as long, you know, the brand though, people still knew that it was Patelco. Mm -hmm. Even though some may not know what you do, there was still, there was a little mini buzz that was there. Yeah. The idea is what you're saying to everyone else is what? What is your message to them given the experience with your credit union? The message is don't be afraid to change. Um, I think it will definitely carry on for you for years uh, to come if you really attempt to take that risk. And I think that's what we did. Thank because you. Because we were originally a credit union for a Pacific Telephone Company, mm -hmm. Patelco. Right. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. <laughs> Any other and comments? I knew that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Looking at more. Are you going to do the tweets for me so I don't have to clean no, up? Well, <laughs> are you tired? Okay, come on, here we go. Slow down. It's <laughs> impossible to draw the distinction between emotional connection and functional connection. They rely on each other. Um, yeah, I, look, I, I think, um, and I, I guess that's why I talk about engagement and journey, is that when you deliver a great journey, and you engage customers, then they relate that as a great brand and great service. Mm -hmm. you know? um, but y again, and so your messaging strategy, what you said about the product before, you can, have a, you can have a great message, but if the product doesn't deliver or you don't deliver, then it's not going to work. Right. And I think you know, that's one of the beauties of Apple. The, almost every single one of their ads is a product demo, but it feels yeah. emotional. Yeah, yeah. And, and they're really, really good at it. There are ways to balance those things. Yeah. It's more difficult in the service sector. It is. Much more complicated Granted. because people deliver the service. So it, it's, it's much easier when you have, you know, product standards and you know every iPad is going to be exactly the same. It's, right. it's and people don't run out of their, right. their credit union with but, their checkbook, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but here's an example. Like, so Citibank, and I'm picking on Citibank a lot today, so do it, that's do it, fine. Do it. um, so Citibank launched an Apple store. Well, they even called it an Apple store, and they put one in Union Square in New York, and they put one in Shanghai in China, and they called it their Apple store concept. So you go in, they've got all this uh, glitzy technology, they've got media walls and you know, interactive tables and all that sort of stuff. So I went in to Union Square to sort of try this out and sort of see what this Apple store was about. And um, you, know, you guys have all been into an Apple store, right? You know what the Apple store experience is like. It's not just about the technology they have there, but the whole, the whole package, including the fact that you can pay with your, you know, on a mobile exactly. phone, right? But so I went into the Citibank's Apple store. And I sat there for 15 minutes and no one came and talked uh, to you me. You can't go in an Apple store and not be talked to okay. within five seconds. seconds. Right. Exactly. So yeah. you know, it's like, okay, guys, just having technology in the, in the branch doesn't, it's not a revolution. Exactly. Right? Yeah. 
Yes, I'll write another question. And we are down to about our last five minutes. Yes, your question, your name and your organization first. Um, I'm Georgine Goodell with Belco Credit Union in Denver. And um, I find it real interesting when you continue to talk about surveys because I think sometimes credit unions um, are very controlling in their surveys. Let me ask you the question and you get the answer that I want to hear. <laughs> and, I don't think, and I don't think that... To justify a I'm budget sorry, spend. That was, yeah. That's fairly provocative, as <laughs> you all were saying up on the stage. So I think we need some leadership in that piece. We want to know what they really think, not leave them to what we want them to say to us. And I think that's the new revolution in Facebook and Twitter is yeah. they will tell you mm -hmm. what Absolutely. they think. And how do we take advantage of that versus let me call you? When you said, let's get a bunch of people in a room and just talk about it. And what do you think about the word credit union versus let me send you 15 questions how do we make that happen where we get the information we want to really obtain there through is, Facebook and Twitter, et cetera, versus let me ask you the question. Is there a way to do that? Yes, there are. There are lots of ways to do it, and I, I use the term survey loosely. Uh, there are tons and tons of new methodologies for getting the answers that we really need to hear, not the answers that we want. And as a matter of fact, even focus groups are starting to become a, a place yeah. where people they don't tell the truth. So there's a, there's a lot of, they will tell you in a focus group what they think you want to hear yeah. or what they think the you want to, exactly. Well. And so there are tons of new methodologies. Again, I use the term survey sure, loosely, sure. but there are tons of ways to go at it. And I, I think just working with an agency to mm -hmm. design what that research is gonna be is just an easy answer. So but this is, a, but this is a way to, may I just interject a couple of things that have come here? Stop the campaign approach. Strong urgency and strong partners to create engagement across all channels. Some brands lend themselves to a story but not credit unions slash banks. What's Chase's story? So in other words, within the financial services industry, there is opportunity to create a new story, a new look, a new impression based on the ability to get this kind of information and then have a behavioral shift. Well, and, and actually, you just proved the point because if if Chase doesn't have a story and Bank of America doesn't have a story and all the other big banks out there don't have a story, Wells Fargo just came to New York. I can't tell you at all what their story was in coming to New York and they should have had one because mm -hmm. they had a perfect opportunity to do it. Yeah. But right now might be absolutely right for a story and that story could be unbanked. Mm -hmm. I, there are some great examples of this, but this whole sentiment analysis and there's crowdsourcing, and I don't know whether you've heard, you guys have heard of oh this. Oh yeah, no, we, we right, have so, agencies who are right, crowdsourcing. So, um, you know, we, we look at this from a perspective of, let's not just ask a question and wait for the answer, right? Let's see where, what new directions this sentiment or discussion or, you know, it, people could be talking about your credit union right now, talking about what they think it, it is that could take you in a completely new direction. Mm -hmm. And um, suddenly you're starting to define your business at, from a strategic perspective, uh, ironically, on what customers actually want from you, okay. instead of you know, trying to say, well, but don't you really think you know, that this is what you really want from us? You know? <laughs> Here is a question. Do you think a credit union deprivation campaign <laughs> would be successful? And there's even an example. Before you answer, you want the example? A line sure. of angry, impatient customers are standing outside a Bank of America while next door, local community credit union has a big closed sign on it. The tagline is, what would your community look like without options? It's an interesting idea. I I don't know about got credit unions, but, <laughs> um, but, but I, I think the toughest of all questions that, that, I, that it's sometimes difficult to ask clients, and I will ask you guys, do you think, how do you think this country would change, if at all, if credit unions were to disappear tomorrow? Okay? If all the credit unions in this country, and not your personal life, I mean, but if they all disappeared, what would happen to America? Would it suddenly, people wouldn't be able to get loans? Would they not be able to get checking accounts? 
Would they not be able to bank? Would they not be able to get mortgages? So if you think that way, um, I'm afraid for many companies, the answer would be America would go, oh well, credit unions are gone. I've still got Chase, I've still got Bank of America, I've still got Schwab. So when I say you've got to find a place to add value, think of it that way, because honestly and truly, if, um, I mean, we almost lost the Lehman Brothers, right? This country would have moved on, guys. Right. Uh -huh. We could have lost Lehman Brothers and we would have moved on. Um, so we need to add value to credit unions. Um, and maybe the unbank is a start to that, but I, I think it's, I think it's a little risky to think we're so critical that if we went away, the world would stop. Because I don't think, I think that's a uh, very, very valid point. If you look at Blockbuster, Borders, absolutely, oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But you know, this is the thing: is that if you look at the publishing industry today, the okay, the distribution mechanism is breaking down, but the content providers still have value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, my fear is that what's going to happen with the financial services industry is because we don't get the whole distribution thing, someone else will take that take ownership of customer from us, and we'll end up being this this big uh, pool of risk mitigation and product manufacturing, right. and someone else will market and sell our products because they get customers better. And Tele telecom, telecom companies, retailers. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, Apple, and Google. even yeah. even closer in, it could be the credit card companies themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Visa. Visa, yep. American Express, and MasterCard are looking for new revenue streams because they're Absolutely. just not getting what they used to get. Mm -hmm. And so you, them making end around is sort of like, yeah. Yep. So that, that's the risk. If you're not really engaged and you don't own the customer, then someone else will. I would like us to end with this. Each of you think about the one thing, give one actionable takeaway that this audience, as you all prepare to leave and go back home, one thing that you would suggest that you want them maybe to focus on, to think about, to remember, as if you're sitting on their shoulders saying, remember you committed to something. Because I think all of you here are committed to affecting some kind of change, right? Who'd like to start? I, I'll, I'll start, one. I'll start. I think where I would start would be with a large dollop of humility, <laughs> which is to say, you know, let. Let me be humble here for a second and, and admit that, that I don't quite know what to do. I don't know how to grow. And, and that first step, and I am going to have to change. You know, I have to admit it. I have to change. That would be a huge first step, I think. Just that acknowledgement, that, that humility, that just because we've always done it this way. Um, as you said, borders could say that too. Yes. And I don't know if this is a 12-step program. You it is. No, it's a, actually, it's, it's a nine-step program. Okay, all right. And I would say that the, the next step is realizing that um, if we all stay fragmented, it's not likely that yeah. the category will survive that's a fair for long. Yeah, that's I, a I good think that's point. very true. And I think, I think um, again, the, the importance of social media, engaging customers and mobile, uh, uh, that's been a a consistent message over these last few days. So I don't know what you have to do to do that, but you know, two, two very easy things is just appoint someone at a very senior level to look after you know, the, those uh, capabilities in the organization. I, I also think that sometimes just the word change is daunting. Um, it doesn't mean you have to go in and wholesale change the entire organization tomorrow. Pick one or two things that you think you can have uh, good wins on and make those changes first and then go on to the next thing. It doesn't have to be everything all at once. Well, we have come to the end of the show.